And so with that, I'd like to introduce our dean, Dean Stephen Shepard, uh, St. Murray's Law School. We have the best law school in San Antonio. I cannot be con contradicted on that. <laughs> and we have the best dean in the best law school. Without further ado, here is Dean Shepard. Thank you, Jeff. And, and I, I always love that joke. I went to Columbia, which was and is the finest law school in Harlem. Harlem, of course, only has one law school. Uh, and, and I think that we are more confident not only in the service of our market here in San Antonio than Columbia was in Harlem, but also of the tremendous love that we have uh, for our legal policy and customer communities in San Antonio. And one of the most important <coughs> parts of that outreach, parts of that service, parts of that support is what the Center for Terrorism Law has done, and also what the School of Law is doing in order to better prepare our students, and also to better provide support for the people that we serve. And I have to tell you, I'm very excited to be here. This program that uh, Jeff Atticott and his incredible team of students have been putting together over the last several months is one I've been looking forward to so much. I was supposed to be in Beijing today, but I moved my travel schedule so I could be here in order to watch part of the program and uh, listen to a lot of the work that is being done and be able to thank you uh, for being a part of what I believe is one of the more important outreaches of any law school in the United States, uh, but also to welcome you to a world that many of you know intimately, but perhaps know your own domain. And there are always more and more areas of geography outside of that. And for those of you that are coming to this for the first time, uh, to welcome you to an arena that is at the very forefront of the development of the law. And from time to time, these things come up, and I'm asked, uh, so what are the most exciting programs, and what are the great things that you do when you're at, at the law school? And I say, well, we have this wonderful terrorism program. And people stare at me, especially if I'm in a foreign country. It's like, no, 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 we're against it. Uh, it's, it's not, not what it sounds like. But in order to understand the needs for regulation, in order to understand the balance that we know in a democracy we have to have, we have to understand and we have to be able to deal with the things that we regulate, even if the things that we have to regulate are themselves uh, terribly dangerous and often dangerous to the point that they have no good. And terrorism in itself is something that has no good. Cyber terrorism is no different. And as I thought over the last several weeks of things that I could add to a program with extraordinary experts um, in various dimensions, both public and private, of the problem of the management of threats of cyber terrorism, I realized that there's a great deal of what we're doing that though the weapon is new, and in some ways though the environment of the weapon, that's, into, that's almost unbelievable. Uh, there are ways in which we get used to thinking of these things and maybe we shouldn't get used to thinking of these things. It's like the idea of a trillion dollars. I was listening to a newscaster say, rather Conveniently, well, it's a four trillion dollar. I'm thinking, you don't know what a trillion is. If you could think of what a trillion is, you'd probably be cowering under your microphone. We get used to these ideas, and we shouldn't be used to these ideas. The idea of a cyber threat is really unimaginable in many ways. We know it exists. We read about it. We see its effects. We have friends who are affected by it. Uh, some of us have friends who are. Uh, creating the code that could either be the shield or the sword of cyber weapons. But it still has an unreality that I think is very difficult. And that makes it especially difficult in my day-to-day -day life as a lawyer. It makes it very difficult to talk about the relationship of something that seems beyond our understanding and to talk about that meaningfully as a matter of law. How do you stand in front of a jury box and talk about a cyber threat? It's like talking about a ghost that actually knocks over things. Well, 
the law of poltergeists would not fill a room like this. Because there's a reality to these things, even though there is this unreality. There is the risk, there is the corporate aspect, there is the commercial aspect, and most importantly for most of us, there is the security and defense aspect of these very real threats. But in the midst of all this, there is to me still the fact that though all of this is new in this unreal way, there's also something that is remarkably old because it is still about human endeavors, it's still about human activity, and it's still about, in almost every way, the misuse of power by human beings. Well, now that's something the law does understand. That's something that we really are pretty good at. That's something that's been around for a long time. And I was just sort of <coughs> pondering. I had a, an air flight the other day, and I was on the, the plane. I was thinking, what, what does cyber threat, this concept of a danger that can be sent by someone through my computer, what does that feel like in antiquity? And you know, there are certain things you could talk about, for instance, you know, stealing somebody's passwords to get into a camp between uh, rival armies. But the example that came to mind is the Sikiare. And those of you that know biblical history, uh, or especially uh, the history around the biblical time, may remember the Judeo-Roman Wars of the 60s, these three short, terrible wars which were to some degree provoked by this group among a larger, more famous group of uh, the, uh, the Jews called the Sikiari. And the Sikiari were among the Zealots. If you remember the Zealots and the Essenes, these are the people who uh, were perhaps the, the left and the right of their age. Uh, someone would have certainly had a Fox News talk show among the Sikiari and maybe a blog. But they were convinced that the worst thing in the world would be for the Jews to make peace with the Romans in any manner that would compromise the ability of the Jewish people to be the complete arbiters of their fate, of the temple, of the, the particular relationship of the Jewish people to their Lord. And they were determined to do whatever it took in order to ensure that no compromise was had, and so they developed a technique of uh, waiting until big festivals, great market days. And if you think, those of you that grew up in either a Jewish tradition or a Christian tradition, if you think of this, or for that matter, it's, it's an important story in Islam. If you think of the, the, the great festivals and the census days, when large crowds of people would be packed together and going in through the gates of the city, the Sikiari would carry stilettos underneath their robes and they would wait until the crowd was very, very tight together and nobody could really see who was doing what, and then they would assassinate people standing up in the midst of the mob. They would look just like the passage of all these other people, carrying their goods, carrying their information, carrying the vital senses, the taxes. They would look just like the traffic of all these other people going in and out of the city gates. And then as they all cluster together and at the moment of the, the greatest concentration and often the greatest celebration, then they would assassinate the people they had targeted in advance. And I thought, this isn't just a metaphor, this is what cyber threats really are. The conduit of information is different. Now it's bits and bytes traveling <coughs> through wires, and cables, sometimes just through the ether but it is still the traffic of something hidden within something that seems innocent. It is still the dangerous amidst the familiar. And it drove both the Jewish government and the Roman government crazy trying to figure out who these people were and how they were getting away with it. How could there suddenly be someone as the crowd parts who'd be lying there dying? This terrible, anguishing peril that could travel in broad daylight that clearly would be lurking for some time before that danger became manifest. Now, in that case, it was one of the several things that led to a terrible war that led, among other things, to the destruction of many, many lives and families. There was an effort 
that failed to stop these types of threats. Now, there is a good part of that story and a bad part of that story. Both the Romans and the Jewish officials were very, very concerned about balancing the needs of privacy, the needs of commerce, the needs of the city. And so they didn't cancel the festivals. They didn't require everybody, there was no body scanner yet. They didn't require everyone to, to doff their robes as they came into the city. On the other hand, in order to finally put this peril to an end, effectively the, the Jewish state had to come to an end. These things can be too easy to create and too hard to stop. But there's another part of the story as well, which is that many of the people who had created this peril died by that peril. Uh, the, the, the attacks they made upon the governments of both Israel and of Rome brought an overwhelming response. And we know, at least all the evidence and the historians, just, I'm, I'm, I'm basically telling the story, for those of you that like this sort of thing, from the writings of an historian named uh, uh, Josephus. We know that all the zealots uh, that were associated with them perished. But the cost was so high, and the pain was so long. And yet, still, everyone involved knew that the balance of allowing day-to-day -day life, allowing the liberties that the Jewish people prize as a part of their special relationship with God Almighty, that these were more valuable than could be sacrificed just to stop some guys with knives. This terrible balance between what we have to allow in order to achieve our greater social ends, those things that we have to allow in order for the privileges that we have built this system of laws, of hopes, management. This system is more precious than even sometimes life itself, even when we know it is our own lives that we may be putting at risk because it was those officials who did not take more draconian steps. This to me is very much like cybersecurity. This to me is very much like facing genuine cyber threats. We know that we need to have more carefully tailored laws. We know that we have to become more adept at searching for the knives. We know that we have to work harder and better at the types of human intelligence that allow us to learn where the CPRI are before they begin to sharpen those blades. We know much more now, in part because we are the heirs of the knowledge of 2,000 years of better, more subtle, better balanced security. We have a constitutional structure that has respected the dignity of every individual, those accused even, those found guilty even, in our system because they remain the reason there is a government, which is to protect all of us. We know that the lessons learned by the officials of the Jewish state and also the officials of Rome that at all costs you cannot surrender those things that you value even more because of a threat. And so I think about the experience that our students have working in the Center for Terrorism <coughs> Law, working with professionals in an array of new and sometimes very old fields. The opportunity not only to practice uh, the tools of law, but to understand the needs of a very sophisticated, very quickly evolving marketplace in which the government, private contractors, private consumers, all of these people, and increasingly, not only do we find uh, corporations in need of these types of protection and their ancillary entities like the insurance market and all of their companies and entities, but private individuals need these tools as well. 
I'm grateful for the leadership that Jeff Adicott has shown, not only for the law school and Texas, but the United States, in engaging in these problems and carrying our students forward to have them able to serve in these important leadership roles of the future. I'm grateful to all of you for being here as a part of this discussion. I think it's going to be a wonderful day. And if you're an employer, I want you please to make sure that you meet some of our students because you might really want to hire them um, in the years to come. And I hope you have as much fun listening to this as I intend to this morning. Thank you very much.